So here are back the examples of the different cell types by anatomy, spiny cells, non-spiny cells, and their different morphology. These are all Golgi stains. Here is examples of actually taking a particular protein and then you, you create an antibody for it, and that antibody is then connected to something which is recognizable by uh, some reaction. And so you use a reaction to then, whenever the antibody binds to something, you go and it's a biotin streptavidin reaction is one of the common things. So you add biotin to an antibody, it goes and finds that particular protein, and then you use streptavidin to add on and identify wherever this biotin is inside the cell. And, and sometimes they can even connect that to a fluorescent marker. And here you can see very, very precisely di different proteins and cell bodies. And in, in, this is probably a blood vessel here. Each of these blues are probably identifying one cell type, and the greens are another protein. Uh, here is a picture of the hippocampus. So I'm a little hippocampus centric because that's where I work. But here are different proteins. So parvalbumin, uh, calretinin, NADPH diaphorase, cholecystokinin, uh, kinase, uh, neuropeptide Y, somatostatin, uh, vascular, uh, I forget, protein. But you can see that these dots are representing where the soma of those cells are that got stained with it, and different cells types, like you can see these are actually the pyramidal cell body layer. All of these guys are being stained with calretinin. Some of them are being stained with parvalbumin. And you find that actually when you do the reconstruction of these cell bodies, they actually look very different. They actually connect to different layers in the hippocampus to different layers. The cell bodies will be in different places. And often there'll be multiple names for the same kind of cell. So a cholecystokinin cell may be called by tufted cell or, uh, you know, the chandelier cells. There's also lots of molecular tools for staining uh, brain slices. So there's things like horseradish uh, peroxidase. So, you know, one of the problems is when cells are really small, a little bit of stain doesn't really go to very far to, to, you know, find it. So you want something which you put in a little bit of it and it causes almost like an auto-catalytic reaction, which then causes more of it to bind up so that you can amplify a signal that was very small to start. So horseradish peroxidase is really good for that. And there's some really, there's rabies dyes, the dyes that are based upon rabies and where you can, you can put it in. And then the nice thing about rabies is it will go up through that cell, stain that cell, and will literally jump across the synapse to stain the next cell too. So there are some stains that stain only within the cell, and some of them that will actually go to the next cells and the next cells, and the longer you let it go, it'll keep going through. This is one of the reasons why rabies is so dangerous, because it actually gets into your nose, and then through the nose, goes keeps infecting more cells higher and higher up in the brain, whereas mostly other things would stay stuck in the nose. And then when you recycle those neurons, uh, the, the ones in the nose get recycled more than you see other places. Fluorescence dyes, so the use of fluorescent microscopes gives us really great contrast between, there's actually the brain only has a few things that are fluorescent. So fluorescence means you shine on the light at one wavelength and then it, it lets, emits a light at a slightly longer wavelength after absorbing it and then re-emitting it. And so you, by shining into one very narrow wavelength to excite a particular fluorophore, you can get really nice contrast because no, almost nothing else in the brain will excite at that wavelength and emit at some other narrow band wavelength. So you can put in a protein which then binds to a particular something else. And we will talk about a lot of these dyes in that uh, one of the very final lectures where we're going to talk about optogenetics and things like that. But there's just so much going on with the connecting green fluorescent proteins to, we, we know what the gene is, so we can insert the gene in with a particular promoter. So cells that express particular proteins express this green fluorescent protein so you can tell, you can just sort of stain everybody and then only the cells that actually produce one particular thing will turn up green. You can put in sugars attached to fluorescent proteins and you make use of the cells 
own ability to transport sugars around so you can see that they'll put in, if you want to know what neurons are projecting to a particular nucleus, what they'll do is take a little crystal of dextran, fluorescently labeled dextran, so dextran's a kind of sugar. They'll put it in there, and then the, all of the active transport you see in the cells will then suddenly go up, and you'll see that sugar go straight up a pathway and then start staining a whole pool of neurons which we're projecting to this spot. So this is one of the ways we go and find cells that are projecting into an area we're interested in. One of the things that I use a lot are, are called AM dyes. So these are dyes that are actually functional dyes. So a lot of these dyes we're talking about are just staining anatomy. But you know we know cells are always constantly doing stuff. And so one of the things they're doing is firing action potentials. And when they fire action potentials, calcium comes in. And it turns out the change in calcium concentration is one of the highest changes from a very, very low concentration of calcium. We have lots of chelators inside the cells to maintain calcium very low concentrations. And when action potentials happen, sodium and calcium comes into the cell, and you get like a hundredfold increase in calcium sometimes. And these dyes go in, they're actually really neat dyes in that they are inactive, and then they are, they are seen by the cells as a sugar, so this AM thing gets is identified by the cells, brings it in, it cleaves that thing off because it thinks it's, it's an energy source, and that cleaving actually then activates the, the, the dye, and then whenever calcium comes in, you see a change in fluorescence. So you don't see any of the signal from the calcium outside the cell, which is really high, and you will see huge changes in fluorescence inside. And we will talk a lot more about that in one of the very last lectures of this class. And then the new things are optogenetics, which people recognize there are cells that, like bacteria that respond to light and you get different amounts of ions that, that start going uh, when you shine light on it. And so then they started introducing these into mammalian neurons and then now you can take a neuron and shine a light on it and you can make it stop firing action potentials and you can shine a light on it and make it fire action potentials. And so now we can not only measure the activity in the cells but we can actually stimulate and inhibit neurons in sort of a realistic pattern. And so uh, this is very, very cool stuff. This is really the, the whole future of neural engineering and is going to be the, pretty much the last lecture I will give.